Sorry, I'm seeing if we can have our tester mic here. He went away from the screen. I will right, well, keep working on that with her and then we'll just go ahead and get started. OK, welcome everybody to the what are we in March? Uh, Bicycle pedestrian advisory committee meeting. Thanks for being here on a very nice sunny day outside. Um, do we have any public comment? At least I can hear now, so we're good. Yay. All right, so I'm not hearing anyone or seeing any hands for public comment. So we will go on to staff updates, and I think Kelly will start with you at WashDOT first. Sure. Um, so Recently, we started the SR 503 corridor study. Um, we are we just had our first technical advisory committee meeting last week, and we'll be working on kind of developing existing conditions over the next several months. We just kind of developed a um, an expected timeline for the online open house and public comment period, and we're kind of expecting to be reaching out to the public and specific community organizations in the late summer to early fall. We'll kind of spend um, the initial few months gathering data um, and we'll use some of the online open house materials to fill in on where the corridor needs are. Um, a big piece of that plan is going to be focused on active transportation connections and safety. So we'll be able to present kind of our findings on crash data and um, level of traffic stress at the time um, when we bring it to the public. So that's kind of just getting started. We're excited about that. Um, maybe the other update that I'll share is that the WashDOT call for projects for the Safe Routes to School and PED Bike program um, was just released at the end of last week, I believe. So local jurisdictions have the opportunity to um, submit applications for this funding. Notably, um, the state transportation budget for this program was increased like times three of what it was last year. So. Um, there's going to be a lot of projects that can be implemented throughout the state, which is really exciting. Another kind of bucket of money, oh, I guess two other things related to the um, state legislature. Um, there's going to be another kind of bucket of money for something called Connecting Communities, where um, WashDOT's going to look to fund improvements in communities that have been divided by state highways. So that would be um, connections for active transportation across those highways to make sure that communities have connections. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that um, we're still trying to kind of um, figure out exactly what this means for our agency, but there was kind of a piece of the legislation talking about complete streets and any project over a certain threshold. I think it was like 500,000. Um, needs to take a complete streets approach. So um, all of this is still going to need to pass through the governor's desk, um, but I'm, we're, I don't think we're expecting many changes to occur. So um, in the next like month or so, our um, internal folks are going to be kind of figuring out what that means in terms of implementation for us. The good news is that it's a lot of funding and attention that's being given to bikes, bicycles and pedestrians um, on and around our state highways. So we're really excited about that. And I think going forward, there's going to be a lot of projects coming to the region. Hey, Kelly, I, sure. I did see a, an email from Senator Cle um, uh, Annette Cleveland. She was saying that uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the transportation bill Past uh, included funding for the, uh, the the pedestrian bridge over Stapleton. Yes. Over uh, SR 500. Yeah, I believe that's true. Um, I know that our teams have been working on um, kind of getting the design of that further along. Um, so I, it's great to hear that 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 potentially has the funding to go to the next stage. Yeah. Yeah, we're excited about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know it's one of those things that would probably would have we could have submitted that for the connecting communities kind of pot of money too. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's great. We're going to get to um, have a lot more projects like that. Yep. Yay. Um, for the SR 503 stuff, is that all going to be online open houses or are there going to be any in person ones? Yep, we made the call. Um, to just keep everything online. So we're gonna have like a month long online open house and then have like one virtual meeting to have like a, you know, I don't know if forum is the right word, but um, have the opportunity to kind of converse with the public about 503 um, in a kind of conversational setting. Um, I think there's a couple reasons for that. One, we don't know exactly what the world is gonna do. So I think it's, a little bit on the safer side to just assume we'll say virtual. And the other thing is that um, we've just gotten a lot of success uh, reaching out to people through virtual open houses and surveys and things like that. Um, one consultant I was talking to said that they got like 500 responses to an online survey when they would usually get like 10 people coming to a public meeting. So we want to make sure that we're getting a lot of um, input and feedback. And so um, We'll be doing that in addition to sending out like mailers and having social media posts and kind of all those things to promote um, bringing people to our website and um, the conversation opportunity. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Any other questions for Kelly? All right, I think Linda, you're up next because I don't think we have anyone else on here and I believe that goes right into the, the new business presentation as well, correct, here? Yeah, I just have uh, one thing to report under news, and that's, again, funding for uh, bicycle pedestrian projects. Um, we at RTC have received more federal money than we anticipated, so at a one-time call for projects, and in this round, the Port of Vancouver's Renaissance Trail Segment 5 is funded for design. And, in, and then also Washougal um, has also been funded for design of a shared use path along um, South 27th Street in Washougal. So anytime we can get design going, it really primes the pump and then we're able to be more competitive when we apply for programs such that Kelly um, described earlier. So it's good news for the region. That's nice. <clears throat> is is Linda uh, is is uh, segment five? Is that the one that approaches the uh, um, uh, uh, the Vancouver um, the dump, the uh, the recycling center? I think it is. Okay. I'm not absolutely certain where the extent of segment five is, but it does say, note that it's on the southern shoulder of SR501. So I okay. think it is going further further west. It would be nice to see that built. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, sorry that I'm late. Well, that's fine. You're just in time. We're doing staff updates. <laughs> if, if you wanted to chime in and share anything with the city of Vancouver, that would be fine. Yes. How how extensive are the staff updates usually? It's pretty light. We're, we're in a minute. <laughs> Two minutes? OK. <laughs> yeah, the clock's going. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, is there a timer or like a little countdown thing for me? <laughs> uh, let's see, what are we working on? So we are in the process of evaluating a project on Fourth Plain Boulevard. So between Main Street and Andreessen, we're looking at the potential of repurposing a travel lane in each direction on the corridor. And so we've got the baseline traffic analysis finished for that, and then also the modeling results finished for that. And so we are working on kind of our, our next steps with the project and what potentially our public outreach would look like. And for the corridor, we don't have like a set design going into the project. So if we do move forward with repurposing a travel lane, in each direction, it's a conversation with the community about how that space would be used. So we've talked about potentially adding bike facilities in the corridor or a um, business access transit lane. So what they call a bat lane, where it's predominantly transit only, but if somebody needs to make a right hand turn, 
into a business, they can use the lane for that, that CTRAN could utilize for the bus rapid transit. Or in some cases, some of the businesses have said that they're interested in adding parking along the corridor. So along with looking at repurposing the travel lane in each direction, we're also looking at ways to improve safety on the corridor. It's one of our highest collisions in the city, particularly for vulnerable users, people walking and biking. So we're on a timeline right now. The it's actually it just the project got broken up in the last week or so. We were going to be doing a pavement treatment on the corridor from Maine to Andresa next year, but it got broken up. And so next year is just going to be from Maine to Fort Vancouver Way. And then in 2024, it's going to be from Fort Vancouver Way to Andreessen. And that's to better align with, so the, the city received through the federal stimulus package that was passed related to COVID, we received $40 million in funds from uh, from the government. And so we're going to direct 30 million of that to the fourth plane corridor. And so there's going to be a much larger community discussion about how to utilize those funds in the fourth plane corridor. And that's not necessarily capital based funds that the city received. It could be used for building child care facilities. It could be used for supporting small businesses in the community. It could be used for affordable housing. So there's a lot of different options for that $30 million, but we've also talked about the potential of making safety improvements in the area, sidewalk infill, you know, additional crossings and things like that. So that's why that section from Fort Vancouver Way to Andreessen was delayed a year. And so that whole conversation and it's our, uh, the acronym is ARPA, the ARPA funds that we'll be spending, there's a, that community conversation will be taking place probably later this summer early this fall, because we're in the process of trying to get some staff on board to help with that. So that's kind of the major, I know that was a long time. I think I'm past my two minutes, but that's, <laughs> that's like the, ma that's the major project. <laughs> There's others, but that, that's the major one that we're working on right now. Since since we're talking City of Vancouver stuff, so I rode my bike down to, to uh, the, the FedEx, the Kinko's for the, the new building on, uh, so, um, it's, so that's Columbia? No, no, that's, that's Broadway. Is that Broadway? It's C Street. C Street, between, yeah. Street between Street. Mill Plain and 15th? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so C Street. So I, I went to park my bike there, but there's no bike parking. And then, then the FedEx guy said, this is actually the back of the building. I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, how'd that happen? <laughs> it, was the, it was the facing C Street? He said it was the back of the building? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's the side that faces the Chevron. Huh. And he he was telling me Al Angelo said that's the back of the building. And it's like, huh. That's okay. interesting. There's no bike parking back here. Well, I can look into that. So we chained up to the uh the light post, which is fine. All right, any other questions for Jennifer? All right, so we will move into new business, I believe. I don't think any other staff jumped on. I don't see any. So we'll go to the RTC Active Transportation PowerPoint. Yeah, so I'm going to provide this presentation. This is Linda David. I work with Southwest Washington Regional Transportation Council. So I'm going to bring you an update on active transportation planning, and I'm going to focus mainly at the regional level. Uh, though there's also some news about state and local active transportation planning and also federal opportunities um, with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, key here is coordination and some measure of consistency between the federal, state, regional and local active transportation planning efforts and strength of the active transportation planning program will be in all agencies continuing to work together with support from citizens to make a safer and a healthier transportation system for all users. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Gary. Yeah, and just tell me to move. Yeah, I will. Okay, <laughs> so that basic this slide shows the um, the outline of what I'll present. So if you can go to the next slide. 
Um, this group probably doesn't need reminding, but you know, first of all, we need to consider what is active transportation. Uh, and for this, I'm turning to the um, definitions which are used in the state's active transportation plan. So active transportation is human scaled and often human powered um, transportation. As a bicyclist, as a person using some version of a bicycle, but it can include e-bikes and tricycles. A pedestrian is a person uh, walking and includes people using mobility devices such as wheelchairs, canes or walkers. And then active transportation plans also um, refers to rolling, which are people using wheel devices such as wheelchairs, skateboards and foot scooters. There's a whole array of um, transportation. Um, next slide. So as I said, I'm first going to turn to consider the Regional Transportation Council's Regional Active Transportation Plan for the Clark County area. Um, next slide. So RTC began work on a regional active transportation plan early in 2020 um, with consultant assistance from Alta Planning. And the directive for developing a regional active transportation plan came from a recommendation in RTC's 2017 certification review by the Federal Highway um, and Federal Transit Administrations. And the federal agencies asked RTC, and I quote from the certification review, um, to evaluate bicycle and pedestrian programs, policies and practices, and identify any barriers that may prevent individuals with disabilities from equal opportunity to reach the same level of achievement that is provided to others. Um, so the Regional Active Transportation Plan provides recommendations to improve active transportation modes uh, with consideration of health and safety, accessibility, uh, functionality of the system, equity, quality of life, and regional coordination and connectivity. Now, we got somewhat hampered by COVID setting in, so um, the state active transportation plan was delayed and also a lot of the lo local jurisdictions had underway transportation system plans, TSPs, and they also got delayed. So we um, had to separate our work into two phases. And so um, I'm just sort of reporting on phase one here. So the phase one work concluded in September of 2021. Uh, with publication of policy review and context report and also appendices to go with that report. Then in phase two, uh, the phase one report will be taken as a framework and it will be supplemented with information from the state's uh, now, adopt, uh, now completed active transportation plan and also input from the local active transportation planning efforts um, which are underway with the local um, agencies working on transportation system plans. Um, some have recently been updated and some are just underway. So in the phase two planning efforts, um, RTC will be going out for stakeholder and also public outreach to um, get input on this regional active transportation plan. And then our whole goal is to make sure that this plan is available to integrate in what is called the regional uh, the regional transportation plan, which is due for update late in 2023. So we've got two planning efforts at, um, underway here. The regional active transportation plan primarily addresses bicycle and pedestrian modes, and then the regional transportation plan is the overall umbrella um, transportation plan, which covers all modes, including rail, marine, highways, and active transportation. So uh, the plan has an introduction uh, which includes the benefits of active transportation, uh, vision, goals and objectives. It also includes policy themes and existing policies that we have in place. Then there's recommendations for a regional bicycle and pedestrian network as well as recommended programs and policies. So uh, as well as implementation strategies, um, including public outreach and regional partnerships, as well as maintenance, best practices and cost estimates for projects and for maintaining the system. Um, next page. 
the next slide. <laughs> so in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the maps in the report. Unfortunately, this one is a bit difficult to see, but one of the most significant tasks we undertook in developing the Regional Active Transportation Plan was um, compilation of geographic information system, that's GIS information to produce maps to help us identify where the greatest needs for active transportation plan uh, for active transportation in this region. We took stock of what data and GIS mapping layers were available to us, and we also identified where there's gaps in the information layers that would serve us best if we could supplement the information in the future. And this composite map shows um, where the highest demand is in the region for active transportation. I'd include, it includes a composite of demographic factors, equity factors. For example, we located where are the low income populations, uh, the minorities, those with disabilities, those um, don't, that don't have access to cars. And we also used uh, Strava data. Uh, Strava data is derived from an installed app and provides information from cyclists on the routes they take through our region. So Strava data has some limitations. It largely focuses on recreational cyclists, but for now it's one of our major data sources that shows us where the most used cyclist transportation network um, links are in Clark County. So next slide. As I said earlier, um, one of the main recommendations from the federal agencies that we work with uh, was to make sure that we um, address the needs of, of populations that are um, traditionally underserved and also where there might be priority bicycle and pedestrian needs. So this is again uh, a map showing uh, an equity analysis. Um, where are the lower income populations in our region? Um, where might be those with most disabilities who might be most uh, reliant on bicycling and also walking? So next slide. And 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 that's depicted by the, the green colors. Uh, the dark purple is the highest equity scoring areas. So you can, for example, um, see areas along fourth plane well, and also sense. areas along highway 99. And it's just that the Yakult area it always throws a throws me for a loop because uh, that upper right corner a lot of that is DNR land and so that it is but the, for the population that lives there they tend to be lower either lower in income. Yes. So next slide. So as I said, uh, one of the challenges in developing an active transportation plan is obtaining data to find out how many bicycle and pedestrian trips are being made on our transportation system. And as we all know, they're often undercounted. And as I said earlier, um, one data source we use is Strava Metro data. Um, again, derived from cyclists installing an app on their phones and this logs in their trips and their routes. So on the left side of this slide, the graph shows bicycle trips monitored by Strava for commute and leisure purposes in Clark County, and it compares years 2020 and 2021. In 2021, 6,300 people cycling in Clark County used the Strava app to monitor their rides, and 3.8 thousand of those identified themselves as visitors. And then in 2020, which is the height of social distancing due to the pandemic, um, almost 74,000 cycle rides were logged. And data from Strava also indicates the number of tourist cyclists. And though it is more popular among recreational cyclists, Strava data um, acquired from the app does provide us with a year over year comparison. And also um, available on the website um, from Strava are heat maps that can be downloaded, which show us routes that are most popular with the cyclists in our region. So next slide. Uh, the Regional Active Transportation Plan includes a recommended regional bicycle network, uh, both primary and secondary routes. 
um, which provide either connections between routes or their parallel routes to the primary system, which may offer less traffic stress. Um, this map was produced for this phase one report, but we understand it will need review and also will need public comment um, as we develop phase two of the plan. Next slide. So recommendations in the plan include development of an active transportation modes for all ages and for all users to improve safety, health, accessibility, functionality, mobility, quality of life, regional coordination and connectivity. And the phase one report is available on RTC's website. I'll put it in the chat later on in this meeting so you can take a look at this phase one report. And if you've got any comments, questions, just um, uh, contact me. So no, <clears throat> OK. Do you have your chat open? Lisa, can you uh, are you are you able to talk? And we can't hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. There was a button on my, my thing. Um, <laughs> the very first map of Clark County, when it was say identifying areas that might need more more biking, um, a little bit further up. Yeah, it's a complex. That one, this yeah. Yes. It didn't seem like there was anything along. I, I know it's not not county area, but I, I live right by 120, 112th Avenue, and it's just terrible for biking. Like, I don't bike with it, bike on it with my kids. I'll go miles out of the way before using it. So there's not a lot of people using it because no, not many people have death wishes. <laughs> yeah. And there's there there's no real good, like the best north south route is if you go over to 136 and even that's not mm -hmm. completely you know bike friendly there's a big section of it that's just two lane country road with no shoulder so yeah. i'll note that again in phase two report we'll need to sort of get into more detail um of, of some of these routes as i say this is a composite map so it, it doesn't provide perhaps the best of information because you, know, you look at this and go well why is there sort of deep blue showing west of vancouver lake well that's just of indicative of the strava data being sort of put into this composite composite map it's a very fun area <laughs> to bike there's so many elements that are involved in considering you know where do we need better bicycle or where should the priority areas be for cycling and uh, walkability? Where should our investments go? Thank you. Um, there's other people with their hands up. Yeah, my question was kind of about the Strava data too. Is that so that is directly shows the demand because I've never even heard of that app and I write every day. So I'm just wondering, I, I know a lot of people probably haven't heard of that either, but you did mention that it's just something that's used uh, amongst like hardcore cyclists or like bike tours. So I guess my question was how much does that Strava data have um, a, an impact on the demand result? Like what else goes into the, the demand data? Well, what else goes into the demand data is looking at where the low income areas of Clark County, where the current sort of um, density of pedestrian and bicycle use may be, um, looking at where the minorities in, in the region might be located, um, also where are the households located that perhaps don't have cars available to them, so they are most dependent on the bicycling and, and um, walking transportation modes. So it's all those sort of factors got piled in on this map. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I had one more question. Um, so uh, we were talking about Yakal earlier. Isn't it true that Yakal also is like one of the only cities in the county that doesn't get bus service, right? Is there like, it's like a sea tran desert out there basically? It, it, it gets bus service. There's a there's a oh. bus that goes into Yakal. Okay, thank you. It, it, there's if, there's no connections uh, from from battleground to Yakult. There's no stops, but there is a bus route that goes into Yakult. Okay. But I think it's only one or two a day, so it's very yeah. limited. <laughs> it is limited. If you don't want to travel at that time of day, then you're out of luck.
Then Jennifer, you had your hand up. Yeah. I was just going to respond to the comment about 112th Avenue. So that's a project that we're going to be looking at in the city. So that is slated for a pavement treatment in 2024. <laughs> and so starting probably towards the end of this year and fall of some time, we're going to start a similar process to what we're doing on fourth plane where we'll look at potential ways that we could improve safety along the corridor because there is an opportunity to look at repurposing a travel lane or other safety improvements that we can do. So that I just wanted to let you know that's something that we'll be working on here pretty soon. Oh, that would be wonderful. And I'd love to give feedback. Cause like that's that's my area. That's like my biggest my biggest thing. I'm like, I don't it's it's really hard to go north and south just because you have there's um, a suggested bike route, but it's like really twisty and turny. It's not yep. labeled. And I figured it out because I've done it a million times. So I'm like, somebody who's just casually biking is not going to get this. <laughs> yeah, like you were saying, it's a really difficult part of the city to go north south. And so, yeah, that would be great to have you involved in the process to have that voice. And maybe if you had other connections as well. Is that also going to include uh, pedestrian crossings? Because I know that some of those, like those two uh, teenagers that died, I think like two years ago, a lot of times when accidents happen on 112, people are like blaming the pedestrian, like, oh, they weren't wearing visible clothes or anything. But that whole area, like there's nowhere to cross at. And so people just tend to cross on their own. Yeah, that's a, de a definitely another area that we would be looking at given the number of fatalities that we've seen on the corridor. And I should have said, so the extent right now that we're looking at is actually, so it includes Chakalov as well. So it'd be from essentially like McGilvery all the way up to SR 500. So a pretty significant extent of the corridor that we'd be looking at, but pedestrian crossings for sure, just given that there's such a, a lack of um, signals and crossing locations on the corridor. Okay, so if we, if we can go on, I just wanted to make a comment. The regional active transportation plan, anytime we can put in place plans, it really helps to support our region applying for competitive grant funding for cycling and for um, walkability projects. So it can really help us if we can prove that we've got our act together and we know what our priorities are in the region. So that's one of the reasons why we put together the Regional Active Transportation Plan. Um, I'm now going to go on to talk about the state's Active Transportation Plan because we really need to all work in coordination and we're sort of involved in transportation planning and implementation of projects at different levels. So the locals like Jennifer at City of Vancouver are sort of really deal with um, construction of projects within the city. And then I deal with more the regional context. And then also then there's the statewide um, active transportation plan, which I'm going to say a few things about. Um, so next slide. So the statewide active transportation plan was uh, finally published in late 2021 after some delays. And it was done in two phases and partly due to COVID, um, the active transportation plan at the statewide level, we expected to be finished before the regional active transportation plan. And we thought we'd be able to sort of take stuff out of the um, state's active transportation plan and feed it into the region's plan. But it, in fact, uh, it didn't happen that way, partly again, due to COVID delays. Um, so again, this is now the state now has an active transportation plan in place. It is available on the state's um, website for you to review. And the state now asks that in regional plans, active transportation needs on the state system need to be identified in a manner consistent with the statewide active transportation plan. So this will be something that the Regional Transportation Council and local planning partners will work on before finalizing our region's active transportation plan. And this includes measuring the level of traffic stress or LTS, which I think we've spoken about at prior um, BPAC meetings. So when evaluating routes for future changes, um, it needs to be based on this level of traffic stress, which takes into consideration posted speed, the number of vehicle travel lanes, traffic volumes, 
and whether or not there's a bicycle lane on a particular segment of, of roadway. So um, next slide. Goals in the statewide active transportation plan, uh, um, plan are very much reflective of what we have in the region's active transportation plan includes connectivity, safety, opportunity, participation, and also partnership between agencies. So next slide. So in the state's plan, there are a number of metrics and strategies for each of the active transportation plan goals, which were noted on the last slide. And on this slide, I provide the metrics and the strategies for one of those goals, which is safety. So the performance metrics for safety include the number of serious injuries and deaths from traffic crashes of people walking or rolling. And the goal in the state's target zero safety plan is for zero serious injuries and deaths by the year 2030. It's an aspirational goal, but nevertheless very much needed. Safety metrics focus on injury minimization by setting lower speed limits. And strategies shown on the right side panel include using a safe systems approach, which you'll probably be hearing a lot more of over the next few months at BPAC meetings and reducing the level of traffic stress. The next slide. Also, uh, at the regional level, we rely on local active transportation planning, which feeds again into the regional transportation, active transportation plan. Um, so next slide. So this slide shows some examples of local active transportation planning. Uh, I think you've heard from Gary over the past few meetings that Clark County is working on a transportation system plan. And so at its September 21st meeting of last year, the county's TSP sounding board presentation focused on pedestrian and bicycle transportation. I think Gary brought this to the BPAC um, meeting a few months ago. Then recognizing the importance of providing safe pedestrian crossings, Clark County Public Works commissioned two recent reports. And again, I think Gary reported on this, which includes a report on pedestrian crossing treatments and on pedestrian crossing prioritization program that the county now has in place. Then the city of Vancouver is working on an update to its transportation system plan, which was first published back in 2004. So, um, if you want further information on that, it's available on Vancouver's website, Vancouver Moves. Then Battleground finished a transportation system plan update late last year, and it's current and is currently working on its Americans with Disabilities Act trans transition plan. And as you heard from Chuck Green at January's BPAC meeting, implementation of complete streets work, which was funded by the state's Transportation Improvement Board program. Um, their battlegrounds developing a non motorized transportation action plan. And so battleground released a community survey mobility for all to consider active transportation and to support uh, the American with Disabilities Act plans development in battleground. Um, moving on next slide. So support active transportation planning in this region. A team from Clark County recently applied to participate in the 2022 Washington Walkability Movability Action Institute, which I think we, uh, Yasmin and I talked about again at last month's um, BPAC meeting. Um, the institute is sponsored by the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. And as Yasmin and I reported last month, we learned from the state's Department of Health that the team from Clark County was successful and is selected to participate in the Institute together with teams from Thurston and Grand Counties and also from Ben Franklin Council of Governments in the Tri-Cities area. Um, so national experts will help the team to develop an action plan to improve walkability and movability equity and inclusion, safety and connectivity in, in our region. Next slide. So this slide shows the six um, team participants from Clark County. Um, I think you probably know um, the names of most you see on this list. So 
I will represent the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, there needs to be an elected official on the team, so Temple Lent stepped forward and um, she will represent. She will be the elected official representative. Then Gary will represent Clark County Public Works as the transportation participant, and then Bill Bauman, who's a member of BPAC. He represents Community in Motion and his work as mobility coordinator as he advocates for transportation options for the traditionally underserved and those with disabilities. So in early May, our team will be uh, participating in this institute, coming up with an action plan. And again, as I said earlier, the more plans we can have in place, the more we can support um, being competitive for um, grant applications for, for example, statewide programs. Uh, next slide. At the federal level, uh, the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure bill, known as the bill, um, is the new Federal Transportation Act and it presents active transportation opportunities for us. Next slide. So the act emphasizes repair and rebuild of roads and bridges uh, with focus on safety, resiliency and equity and developing a transportation system for all users, including cyclists and pedestrians. So the law has implications for developing active transportation at the state and the local levels, looking to improve health and sustainability. And the grant programs included in the bill include a new Safe Streets for All program that advances the Vision Zero plans to reduce crashes and fatalities, especially for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, it's funded at about $6 billion over the five years of the Act. And then the Transportation Alternatives Program is continued, and at least 2.5% of planning funds that comes to the Regional Transportation Council um, must be spent on complete streets and on multimodal planning. Last slide. So this just summarizes a um, some key dates and timeline. So after hearing about active transportation at the regional, state, local and federal levels, um, I want to conclude with saying that back in 2021, Battleground completed its transportation system plan update and the Regional Transportation Council published the framework phase one regional active transportation plan in last September. And the state's active transportation plan was finally published late in 2021. In 2022, Clark County, Vancouver and Camas are set to complete transportation system plans. And my agency, RTC, will work on phase two of the regional active transportation plan to integrate um, policies and also project priorities from the state's active transportation plan and local plans. And then the um, phase two of the region's plan will likely be finalized and adopted in 2023 and will be integrated into the next update of the regional transportation plan, which is due by the end of 2023. And then from there on out, the regional active transportation plan will be scheduled for regular update and will be updated at least every five years. So with that, um, that concludes my presentation. So any comments would be great. As I say, I'll put in the chat uh, the link where you can find the phase one report. Any comments will be welcomed, but we will be going out. Um, well, again, <laughs> we'll probably have a virtual open house in place on RTC's website to gain more stakeholder input for phase two of the plan. This was a great presentation, Linda. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay. Do uh, Ridgefield, the center, uh, Washougal, do they have any transportation plans that are being included? They haven't got a formal TSP update process in place. They will be working, of course, on updating their comprehensive plans. And some of, I, I know, for example, Ridgefield does have uh, a multimodal plan, which is part of their comprehensive plan. Yeah, you know the the transportation system plans. It's it's not it's not necessarily a requirement by the Growth Management Act, 
-hmm. but it's it's just a nice way to look at the system and it makes sense that way so that's why that's why we're doing it because it's a holistic look at the whole system so and 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 hopefully other jurisdictions when when they have staff available in time they can create transportation system plans as well is it you know because we we've just historically have looked at it in a piecemeal approach and because we, we've got lots of plans throughout the county and it's nice to have them all tied in together into one plan right i do know from the comprehensive planning efforts um, there will be renewed guidance from the department of commerce as all local jurisdictions move forward to update their comprehensive plans over the next few years. Okay. John, you had a question? I think you're still muted, John. Uh oh, OK, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 OK, yeah. Um, the regional transportation plan, not the active plan, yeah. we'll call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that include uh, transit? Yes, it does. OK, yes. all right. Yeah, good. Thanks. Any other questions for Linda on her presentation? All right, I'm not seeing any, so we will move on to old business. Thank you, Linda, for the presentation. It's thinking about moving. There we go. All right. Well, we are going to go over our 2022 work plan. All right, so Michael, I'll pull up the, the, the edits version. Okay. Let's see how well this works. So do you want to just kind of run through this, Gary, since you made the edits and then uh yes mina did but i'll run through them anyways okay <laughs> <laughs> so, uh so it looks like the 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 master plan goal number one we're keeping that developing a bicycle and pedestrian network uh, and then so on on a most of these we've gotten rid of the the text for committee members all so we figured it since it's it's on the work plan that everyone's going to do it so that we really didn't find it necessary to 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 add words to the, to the document so we struck those out and then master plan goal number two education encouragement and safety programs uh, so this is from the sticky note exercise that yasmina did so um this is uh sort of, um uh, so the action item is collaborate with schools to utilize federal and state transportation funds to provide walking facilities. And then the benchmarks, the, uh, the, the possible tasks that we could do, the work with the schools to promote a bike to school day, um, coordinate with other cycle groups to create an educational adult policymakers ride, do a bike rodeo, and the the bike rodeo, uh, we've worked with Bike Clark County in the past, and they they uh, help us set up. Um, well, they they lend us their equipment so we can set up a, a, a um, in a playground um, a, a little facility that looks like a street. So we use chalk um, cones. So we try to teach the kids how to stop at a, a stop sign in the playground. It's um, marked with chalk. And you know, try to teach you, try to teach uh, um, hand signals left, right, and stop. What that means. Tom, did you have a question? 
Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, the, collaborate with schools uh, to provide walking facilities and all this talks about biking. Okay. We could change that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I also had a question. Was that, um, does this just include like public schools or are we looking at institutions like like Washington State University or Clark College or that's, is this just public schools? Uh, I don't believe it says either or. Okay. Because I think that that's kind of a missing kind of push demographic. And um, I also wanted to mention that there's a lot of these hybrid programs out. Um, that actually require parents to drive their kids to the school like there's no um, bus service to some programs that are now coming out so I, I was wondering if that was something that we're looking at now just thinking about the school stuff sure so no, that's fine um uh so tom for a benchmark what would we say promote walking or walking facilities um it, it does have one comment in here uh, walk to school day um, so provide walking and biking facilities yeah because the 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 link can you see the it says uh the link has walk bike to school dot org ready about the event they have bike to school day so but i and then here's the and walk to school day on october 4th so it's there it's just not i see what you're saying yeah the the top line there in green or yellow whatever that is it just provide walking facilities and it um um it sounds like it should be provide walking and biking facilities oh uh, i agree okay Let's change that. Thank you. And I think related to working with schools, I think to this point, it's mostly been working with elementary and middle schools, if I'm correct, Gary, as they tend to have their own programs that we kind of piggyback on a lot of times. And I think that's kind of how we ended up in mostly those areas at this point. Yes, that's true. And, and you know, we we haven't reached out to the middle schools or the high schools either. OK, it's, it's just, just been elementary. elementary. Yeah, it's just been elementary schools. Yeah, because it's kind of a thing once you take the parents out of the equation, you know, the people will do it it's just a lot of people with like elementary school age are like no i'm not having my kid do that i would rather just drive them and so it's kind of you know it's kind of an ignored demographic basically like young people in high school and in college can develop the, start to develop those skills and see that they can still have access to places just riding their bike and not worry about their driver's license as much or paying for gas and have that independence Oh, I agree. This is this is your committee, so you you're, you guys are welcome to to reach out and talk to whichever school you want to to try to to get more education involved. I mean, we're, that's why we're here to advocate for um, people bicycling and walking in our community. And I, I think Bike Clark County runs a program. Uh, I think it's a, kind of a leadership through bicycling program with some high school students, Gary, is that correct? They do, yep. Uh, I think we've had the opportunity to volunteer in that program before. Nice. So, I, I mean, I think we can keep an eye out for that. Um, I don't know if any of us currently have connection with Bike Clark County. That was kind of Anna when she was here. Uh, I, 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 still re I still connect with Peter. He's the... Uh... Okay. He's, he's the main person over there. Yeah, I thought Peter was going to start being at these meetings. Like, I was like, oh, the Clark County BPAC committee by Clark County, right? Like, there's, but. He, he, yeah, maybe that was my fault. Oh, no, I've, is that more like the city? Like, they kind of go with the city committee? Uh, um, it, it, Jennifer, you guys really don't have a committee, though, do you? 
No, we we had a bike ped, kind of an informal bike ped stakeholder group for a little while, but now we've got a formal transportation and mobility commission, and Bike Clark County isn't is not on that. Uh, then just moving on in the document. So it looks like uh, uh, the funding goal was struck out. And then um, master plan goal uh, number four is, what is that? Oh, number three is the new one. Number four was struck out. The active transportation planning and bicycle pedestrian supportive land uses. So action 6.1. Prioritize projects and adopt policies that increase the measures of walkability. Benchmark implementation of the bike and pedestrian master planning recommended sidewalks and bikeways. So that's what we had for the edits version. And then we'll go into the, the final version that we will modify based on uh, Tom's input. So this is how the work plan would look or the work program for the year. So the. Action 4.1.1 .1, I will I will change that to provide bicycling and walking facilities. Are there any other changes that we need to make to make this final? Take your time and look at it. I'll stop talking. It, can you see it uh, um, well enough? Mm. Okay, make it bigger. We can do like yeah. half the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Okay. Excuse me. I'm th th this evening I'm on my uh, Chromebook, but I I've not actually been able to see any any shared screens that you've been posting. Is there? Is there a widget that I can just click to see? You have, you're, you're, you're referring to something that you're looking at, and I'm not seeing it at all. I see everybody here, all the faces. Good mm. That's a good question. Can everyone else see the, the shared screen? Yeah. 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 I, I've maybe been hesitant I, to bring it to bring it up because there, there was a lot going on, but Maybe, maybe you could try logging out and logging back in and it might it might click on that way. I'll, I'll give that a shot. Thanks. Oh, you do um, go to that arrow that you should see like an arrow that's a down arrow and then it's called the share tray. Oh, do you see uh, that? Um, I see, I see a way for me to share. OK, yeah, if I um, click on that, it shows me the screen and then um, the meeting like teams meeting. I don't know if that might work. Sorry. No, I, I appreciate it. Any help? I, I, um, I think what what I see when I click that is a, a miniature version of, of what I see without it. But, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try logging out and logging back in again. I don't really want to. I, I don't want my own individual issue to hold up the meeting here. So. Gary, one quick question about action 4.1.1. Yes. Um, like it was referred before, most of the um, strategies to implement, they are bike related. Are we going to? Round them up. What just went away. No, yeah, no, it went just... away your screen. I see that. That's too bad. What's going on? Who's got my screen? What happened? My screen I think I did it. It's me. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. How do I go back? That's sorry. fine. 
can see it into your place now. We're all watching. <laughs> Share. Did I fix it? No, I just took it back. Okay, sorry. I won't That's mess with you. <laughs> it's fine. I, 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 I was the kid at the at the department store that touched everything. <laughs> just to drive my mom crazy. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> But yeah, we can we can add, we can add that. Well, what are you proposing? I don't know. It's just that if we're going to focus, I mean, either I think that in the top in the action 4.1.1, we need to add provide walking and bicycle facilities to make everything else fit. Or yes. I mean, to me, that will be the easiest way. Well, yeah, so I yeah, I'll add. I'll add the provide bicycling and walking. I've had, so I'll I'll put the bicycle in there. Yep. Then we're good. Okay. So so moving forward, how do you envision that as a committee we're going to carry on um, to implement these goals? What has happened in the past? So right before COVID hit, we started making subcommittees. And there seemed to be some efficiency in that. Uh, people could focus on things they were interested in and then report back to the group. And it seemed to be a little more organized and we were able to get some things done. So I think we can try that route if everyone's open to go on that route. Um, you're not required to be on a subcommittee, but I think that's probably our best way to do that any sort of action really taken is to get into smaller groups and then, you know, have little like, you know, meet outside the training committee once a month or however, you know, the subcommittee deems they want to go about it. But we had started that and then obviously we couldn't do that again for a while, so. <laughs> So do we envision that in the near future we will meet in person or are we still going to continue to meet via teams? It's a good question. I'm not sure. County hasn't said anything to you yet, Gary? Nope. We're following the council's lead. No, and I, uh, the, the Public Service Center is a great building to do presentations. Yeah. We've got the monitors in, in, uh, in the Planning Commission um, work session room that we usually go to. So I don't mind going back there. That's what people want to do. Will they let us in? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know how this is going to work. So we still got to wait. Is, did Michael get back in here? Yeah. yeah he's Can you see the screen? Yes, I'm, I'm here and I, I switched to my uh, my HP computer from the from the uh, Chromebook and it, and it popped right up. The, the, the lesson for me here is don't call into the meeting from a Chromebook. OK, thank you, you. Can see at least. Yeah, yeah, you missed a great presentation by Linda. Now you're Oops. muted. <laughs> Ironically, I, I, I was muted just as I said, I, I enjoyed the audio part, so. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So from from what we're going to do with this uh, the action 4.1.1. We're going to I'm going to uh, add the word um, to provide bicycling and walking facilities. I think that's the. The only edit that I need to make to this. This action item. So I'm going to pull it down to see the other. The one thing we don't have on there is the um, reviewing of um, jurisdictional plans that we do. And I can't remember if my brain's fried lately, so I apologize if we discussed this last month. But, you know, it's kind of always something we've had on there. Did we want to put it back on or are we good with having it off and it's just something we do anyway? 
Hey, Michael, does this, this is the highlighted one work? No, nope, that's not going to work. Yeah, it's the design. It's just design standards. If we said maybe design standards and project plans or something like that. OK. No, I, I agree with you. That, that, that's good input. Is when we yeah, when we're doing a capital road project, it's good for for the community to look at it. And, you well, know, from a, a trans from, from a, a, a bicycle pedestrian point of view. Yeah, we've got a lot of public funding coming, so. Yeah. How about we, we say. Um, review design standards and capital capital projects. I'll do uh, review design standards, comma capital projects and make recommended changes as needed. Yeah. OK. Everyone else is OK on that, of course. Making a note to myself. Yeah. All right, is that it then? Can you scroll back down again? We kind of jumped off that one a little quicker, even though there wasn't much down there. Do we want to say uh, on 6.1.3 it, it increases measures of walkability and biking? OK, we should. Yeah. That sounds like a worthwhile change. So Gary, can you make the changes we just talked about and then send out a PDF? And then and then we can all we can um, review it before the next meeting. First thing we can do next meeting is vote to approve it because we have to do that. And then in that same meeting, we can start working on forming subcommittees to start tackling some of these tasks. Does that makes sense for everybody. Then hopefully by then too, we'll know a little bit more about when we can start doing in person. I mean, obviously subcommittees, it's whatever you're comfortable with. You know, out, out in the world, if you're comfortable with meeting in person, more power to you. Um, but with these public meetings, it just comes to what we're allowed to do with the county at that point. But as, as part of the subcommittees, those technically aren't public meetings, so you can kind of do that if you want to get them done. Right, John, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I guess I was wondering, is this our last chance to make any uh, uh, tweak this any of the uh, wording here at all. In other words, whatever we end up with for our next meeting is pretty much a, a done deal. Or, or can we work it work this like in in intermediately between the next meeting? What What are you thinking? Well, I, I don't really have a specific issue. I'm just thinking that once this comes out, you have time to kind of lean on it, then uh, whether or not you can, you know, we throw out a few ideas, I'll call it. That's okay, well, we don't have to, you know, I just <laughs> I, I just want to know if this is pretty much our last chance to, if, if anyone sees any issues they want to bring up, to, now's the time to do it. Have you participated in the, if, um, in developing this work program? Well, yeah, I, I I know we all worked on the on the board. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
And the other thing on the view is, you know, this is kind of a guide for us to go from. It's not the end all be all of what we're going to do during the year. And then we, you know, we could find something that we want to do that's not on the list that makes sense to do, and we can still do that. It's not like we can't do other things that aren't on the list. And then we can just update this, you know, at the beginning of um, 23. And ultimately, our goal, too, is to have this list updated earlier in the year. But with the turnover of members and stuff this year, it was a little more difficult to start earlier. So. Okay. Sarah. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, it's Thanks. it's because the 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 bike and pedestrian plan is is so big. It's just that we're just taking components out of it. It doesn't mean the rest of it's going to stop, and we're not going to look at it. Yeah. So, like Michael said, if something else comes up, then you guys all agree on doing it, then that's fine. It's 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 your committee. It's just trying to keep us uh, a guide and keep us focused. Understood. Um, I, I had a question about, um, the, you know, we're talking about bikeways and, and walkability and everything. Now, when we talk about that, that infrastructure, does that include the coordination with the traffic lights? Um, um, what do you mean specifically? Um, I guess what I'm talking about is like, um, do, you know how the traffic lights are basically like four cars and they don't really uh, sense you sometimes on your bike or or things like that, like the lights and intersections are set up are mainly to get cars through as fast as possible. Um, when we talk about, you know, the bike lanes and having that space is, are we also, is that just also included with the traffic lights and that coordination or? Sorry, am I saying that really weird? No, you're fine. Uh, it's just, you know, um, um, you know, it's it just uh, so, you know, um, it, it's what, what, it, it, there's there's a lot involved. So when we're looking at the work program, what it, it's, you know, if if we're looking at a project that the county's working on, say like a, um, a 50th Avenue and they've got a plan set out and it the the we would know where the signal is going to go and and the the plans for the the the, uh, the striping where the crosswalks are going to be at where the sidewalks are but we won't necessarily get into the timing of the signals okay is that something you wanted to do oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, so well, I always you know, I think I've talked to you about it, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, you know, and it's um that was so it's that's that's on the list. We were, we're well, what I'd like to do next because we we've created that that recent video of the the um the the new laws and how to ride in a buffered bike lane. So the next video I wanted to uh, create was on how to ride bikes uh you know through a, a, a signalized intersection you know because because with this the county signals a lot of them will will pick you up and so you don't have to you don't have to it, we're, they don't use the loop technology so you don't have to find the magic spot in the asphalt it's that the cameras will will catch you and register and the the signal will change and i'm not sure it i i don't know if it's like that in the city of Vancouver and all of the signals. Um, I was also going to say that uh, I'm sorry with like the flashing yellow lights. I think those can be quite dangerous for cycles, a uh, cyclist trying to turn left. So I know that that's something that the county is putting in a lot of, in a lot of places with those flashing yellow lights. So I was just wondering if that was if we had any say in it or if it was a part of the infrastructure and everything. So. Well, I yeah. like those. Because they eventually do turn green if, if you stay there long enough, but. Right. Yeah, well. No, and, and yeah, the, the. The 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 flashing yellow, you know, there there's some benefits to that, you know, and, and you know, there there might be some downsides to it as well. And I think the goal of, of flashing yellow signal is to get vehicle movement through the through the intersection section. You know, and you know, there's, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if I mean, you say it's bad. Why? Um, because it, you, 
the cars are just coming and then you have to wait a while. And then before you get to go, you might not be able to, and then you're stuck out there. Um, and a lot of times I, I even read that like people going through are supposed to yield to cyclists, which I think most people don't know that. And I didn't even know that. So a lot of times it can be kind of scary, like what's going to happen. I'd rather just have that permission to just go. Um, but you know, it's not a thing. That's just something I thought about that was like, oh, this doesn't necessarily look like it's made for safety in mind. Um, yeah, but with the traffic cool. lights, I just think, I mean, there's there's a few that I could think of where people wait so long, you know, you're at the intersection. Oh, it doesn't sense me. You know, you have that legal right to go after you waited a certain amount of time, but it doesn't mean that it's safe. And I think that a lot of new people or people that don't ride that often will take that risk and, and just go and they may not have that that line of sight. So that's the only reason I brought it up. But if it's not something we have control over, just keep well, my magnets. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it, it, you know, the, the, the bike pedestrian master plan does not specifically go into performance measures. That's what you're talking about. So, so you know, it's our, our transportation system plan where we, we bring that up and, and we'd like to have performance measures for 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 people walking and for bicyclists because it's you know it, it it's not equitable it's not fair that 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 intersection is dedicated for car movement it's like why why do i have to wait three minutes to safely walk across the street and let all the cars go by it's, there's got to be a more equitable situation so that's 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 uh, on the radar and and in the works It'll it'll happen. It's just a matter of time, um, you know, because we don't we got time. <laughs> we got to figure out how to how to make all of it work. What's equitable? Who gets what? You know, yeah, if you could do Mill Plain and Brant like tomorrow, that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah, but that's the city of Vancouver. That's that's, I know. <laughs> that's the one I'm always sitting at. And I'm like, uh, come on, well, light. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, that's yours. <laughs> I'm taking notes, so I'll see what I can do. Right. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Tommy right. had for a while, so I just want to make sure that was from the last one still. What's that? Tom's hands went up for a while, so I just want to make sure that it was just left up and. All right, yeah, left it up there. No worries, I just wanted to make sure we weren't ignoring you. Yeah, thank you. And then John, I saw your hand pop up for a second there. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it did. And then I decided maybe that was on the uh, looking at it, looking at it wrong. But the uh, the flashing yellow, I guess, is the one for the left turns is what we're talking about. Uh, if that's the case, what I what I've heard about it is the speed limit of this upcoming oncoming traffic is uh, if you're driving a car and not necessarily whether you're on a bike or not. Depending on the speed limit, it may be more difficult to estimate how fast the cars are approaching. And that's when you can sometimes get into trouble uh, because you're thinking, well, I can make it. And, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a risk factor there. And I, I've read where beyond 35 miles an hour, the flashing yellow for a left turn is pr probably not recommended. But that was just an opinion, you know. I'm I'm just throwing that out. That's all. I just thought I'd mention it. That's all. Yeah, the one I'm thinking of. I'm sorry. It was on. Um, I think it's Andreessen and 78th. If you're trying to turn left, which you can, uh, it's kind of a good connect on the bike if you can't take Patton and you're trying to go in a different way in Hazeldale. Um, but that one is very scary on a bike. Um, and also turning into the VA campus from Fort Vancouver Way. That's on a flashing yellow. But I think that Andreessen, isn't that, that's 35. I think those are both 35, but I'm not sure. But those are just examples that I could think of. And that one's county. You know, I, I could talk to my signals group and see if they're, they have time to come out and talk to, talk to us about yellow flashing signals. I think that'd be good. We did it a few years back, I don't know, five, six years ago, and I thought it was pretty informative at the time. Just understanding how our signals work and what their goals are and we yeah and the, the the county's got some new adaptive signals that they're 
they, they, they're installing on uh, Highway 99. Uh, so they can. So uh, the goal is to um, the signal adapts to the traffic flow. So not not every not every uh, uh, signal length is the same. It it, it varies with uh, the amount of uh, volume of traffic. Is that auto traffic? Like, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't understand. So they they expect. Oh, it's a certain amount of people at five o'clock. So we're gonna let this light be green more. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. So I mean, because it's, it's the old technology, it's it's a signal. It was ten seconds for, or say it was five seconds for yellow, and then you know, uh, ten seconds for green, twenty seconds for green, and then it went red. So it was all a specific measurement. And now the adaptive technology, I, it fluctuates with the uh, the volume. I'm not I'm not a signal expert, so that's kind of what I uh, a little bit of what I know. But I mean, it's there's technology out there to help move uh, the flow of traffic. And that yeah, and that and those same signals. Uh, we we have the ability to to uh, uh, use the cameras in them to count pedestrians and people biking, so that's that's where the the county is headed. Is is once we have enough of uh, uh, um, signal support, we'll be able to start using performance measures based on what we have in our network, and we'll be able to count and track where where demand is at, so we could adjust and make improvements as needed. But I think one thing that for us to keep in mind too, when we talk about these things, is the government agencies can't do much without data, and a lot of that data has to be collected by them essentially, whether it be through contract with a, a consultant or you know someone else has done a study that they can accept or something like that. But every every decision they make or thing they implement has to have data backing it up. And so sometimes when you see these things, you don't understand why they're not happening because they seem logical. Some of it comes down to data collection or needing to prove that this, they can spend the money this way. So we just always want to keep in mind that that's one of the hurdles that we're having to deal with on some of these projects and some of these other things that we're, you know, going through and looking at when we look at these things. And so on that line, do you think maybe um, looking at other places and then saying this worked for them? Because I've heard that like for bicycling and walking infrastructure, it's like not something where it, it's like if you build it, they will come kind of thing. And so it's not really something that like, oh, everybody wants it. But does that make any sense? Like it, it's hard to gather data on something and say, oh, there's a demand for it when there's nobody doing it because they feel that it's unsafe to do. But if it was already made, they would do it. Oh yeah, so, you know we there there is literature out there that's available. So not not everyone. If we're going to talk bikes, not everyone prefers a bike lane. So just because I, there's a bike lane doesn't mean that I want to go ride my bike next to a, a five thousand pound vehicle that's doing forty miles an hour. Uh, a lot of people are not comfortable with that. So what we're going to look what what we're in our transportation system plan. What we're looking at is trying to come up with some other way to to get movement around. So it doesn't have to be a bike lane. We need there there are other ways, bike boulevards, shared roads to get people through, and and oh, uh, off of um, off of higher stress streets. So I'm looking yeah, I mean, what, when you say what are other communities doing? So we we've been looking at that. And and we know what other communities are doing. It's just trying to get it integrated into what we're doing here in Clark County. Uh, I just meant that for the data. Like, is that how we gathered the data? Because uh, I, I guess we was speaking before was about like, we have to show this data that we need this or or what have you. Um, so we don't, it's, we don't have data really on bikes, people biking or walking. So from Linda David's presentation, the, they use the, the Strava data. Which is which is self-selecting, based on people who who have uh, uh, a smartphone, and they can have the app on it. And you know, it's and th but that's all we have, you know, regionally up here in in Clark County is is that limited data set. Otherwise, we really don't have any data because you know, historically we have not we. Uh, it, 
it's the the truth of the matter is 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 Clark County's been very auto oriented, and the way the Growth Management Act is set up, it's it it, it was set up to m measure and monitor traffic uh, uh, traffic volumes on on public roads, but you know the the legislative legislation has changed, and now we're looking at more more ways to get people out uh, by traveling through bicycling and walking. And, and but then how do you prove the demand is the problem? So we say, yeah, we want it, but who who, who wants this? Who's the we? Where are you going? Are you talking so, about the to get the grants? To well, say, yeah, to get the grants okay. to, to get stuff built. It's like, OK, so where are you going? What do you have to connect? I mean, what's the demand and who's going to use it? Yeah, because I've always I've read about like the bicycling infrastructure, like building that up is if you build it, they will come. Right. And so people choose not to bike because the infrastructure is not there. If it was there, they would do it. Um, but but I that's, where, that's where using some of that outside literature can be a source of data collection. It just needs to be good literature from, you know, a reputable agency or, you know, private consultant that can be utilized. and it can be difficult to apply because then it can be like, well, our community is not that, so we can't say that's comparable data. So, you know, it's it's usable, but sometimes it's difficult to get it used, but it's something that is looked at. Sorry, I wasn't trying to confuse anything. I just want everyone to... No, that's a good clarification. The difficulties we can face trying to get things implemented. So to wrap up the, the work program real quick here. So Gary, you'll make those edits. And then um, send it out to everybody and we'll kind of look through it, make sure we're good. Next month we'll vote on it and then we'll start working on forming our, our subcommittees to start tackling some of these goals that we have. Now that we can start to get out in the world a little bit more, it should be get, getting easier to get some of these things taken care of. hope so. And then, and I was, and I think that was the last item on the agenda, Gary. Can you swing back over to it? Just our reminder for volunteer opportunities, as always. If you, if you, you know, have one, go ahead and send it to Gary or myself, and we can pass it out to the group if it comes up mid-month, so that way, we, you know, I tend to forget things the next day, so. If you want to get it to the group, as soon as you find out, get it out to one of us and we can get it out to the group. Um, Lisa, you had something that you wanted to ask. Yes, uh, just a second. Let me help my kids. They're um, roller skating. Um, I, I think it was from this group that there was a, a map of Clark County with the speed limits of the roads. Did that? Did I hear about that from this group? Possibly. Okay, I really, I would really like to find that map, but I can't find it. There's um, a, it's kind of like a bike award for um, either cities or counties or organizations. And I was, it's not active right now, but it's it's supposed to be coming up soon. And I that would be very helpful for filling that out. But yeah, we, but, um, I, I think at some point in recent time, we have a we've had a, a speed map. That, you know, it's it's available. Uh, this um, the speed limits on um, GIS and maps online. Okay, let me let me look there. Lisa, I use the the maps online quite a bit, so I can. Uh, if you can't find it in the next day or so, I can send you some rough instructions to help you try to get there. Yeah, I've, I've used it before. I'll, I'll poke around on it, but um, sorry, who was talking? That was Michael. Mike? Sorry, it was. So, uh, so go go when you're in Maps Online, go into the transportation system layer. Or the, the transportation layer, I think is what it's called.
see if it works faster for you, Gary. It was going slow for me today. Yeah, it's been going slow for everybody. Uh, transportation system, that's what you want to click on. Had it right. Crab road log, there we go. So the crab road log, and then the speed zone. There we go. How's that? Yeah, I think I was looking at a different map, but this works. And then you could make a map. Print the map. <laughs> there we go. And it's got the, the legend. It's not bad, actually. <laughs> You can change scale on that, obviously, if you want to. So you don't yep. have to just on the whole county. Very cool. Thanks, Gary. That's yeah, a great tool. Great. You're welcome. All right. So, You're welcome. With that is there any other new information or questions or any other topics that anyone wanted to talk about for this month's meeting? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to just uh, bring up some. I, I think I brought it up last month, uh, but um, if if we, if anybody on this com committee or anybody you know has a bike that they would like to make some room in their garage or storage, there are a uh, fairly uh, excuse me, I got the hiccups, but there's a fairly large number of Af uh, Afghan refugees. Um, it's difficult for them to get driver's licenses, um, but uh, anyway, if if you drop off a bike at Bike Clark County and label it or tell them that that you want to donate that to the Afghan refugees, there's a a, a, a group of bike mechanics that uh, every Sunday. And sometimes another day they will come in and they will make sure that the bikes are fully operational in great shape and then don't and then donate to them to these uh, these people that are really in need. And it's a it's a good thing. And if uh, if I don't know that we have a way of publicizing it, but but we, you know. We have a, a way of looking in our own garages anyway. Thanks. Well, thank you for sharing that. All right, and then Bike Clark County, for those that don't know, just in case, is uh, in downtown Vancouver. Yeah, it's in the the building uh, of the uh, uh, the Burgerville headquarters. That's on it's on Main Street, just just maybe a block, a, a little over a block north of uh, Mill Plain. <laughs> Very slow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Looks like they painted it. Uh, it's this is this is picture taken twenty twenty two oh uh, twenty nineteen. So it's a couple years old. What's that cross street right there, Gary? I think it's, it's the one just north of just north of Mill Plain. At 16. So Main 16. and 16th is where they're at. Yeah. Main and 16th, yeah. Yeah, if you got an old bike, you can take it there and it'll go to a good place. So exactly. yeah, it's <laughs> tough. 
All right, is there anything else? So keep an eye out for Gary's. Oh, John, your hands up. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I won't. I'll try not to prolong the meeting. Uh, I I got that email. I know Gary sent out to everyone regarding that uh, webinar uh, on. I believe it was entitled uh, "Stories from the Bike Equity Network." Uh, I couldn't attend the second presentation, but I did attend that one, and uh, it, it wasn't bad. And the reason I'm mentioning it is that. I, I never heard of it before, but there's this organization, the Transportation Research and Education Center, uh, I guess as part of uh, Portland State University. They, they, they record these presentations and it's all about transportation, bikes, but other forms of transportation, other, uh, obviously. And uh, I could send out the link to that if anybody's interested in in some of the subject matter that they uh, they present, uh, then you know you might want to just take a look at it and see if there's anything there of interest to you. But thanks, Gary, for sending that out. Uh, it's not just about bikes, but it does cover a lot of bike information and uh, organizations and activities. So just uh, thought I'd mention that. Thanks. Yeah, Portland State's great. Yeah. Thanks. All right, anything else? <clears throat> All right, so keep an eye out for the email from Gary and then think about you know what you'd like to, to work on over the next year and we can get some groups together and start tackling some of those tasks as the weather gets nicer. So thank you everybody, have a good evening. Unfortunately, it's dark now, so it'll be difficult to enjoy the nice weather, but that's all right, hopefully it'll be nice tomorrow. Oh, hopefully. Thanks. Thanks. In a month. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.